Yours. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I think uh, the best is for last. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the organizers to the CV for Animals workshop. Um, the organizers of this are uh, Pyun Su, Helga, Anju, Natalia, Shohei, and myself. And uh, I just want to start by giving a little bit of perspective because um, in some ways this feels like a new field in computer vision, but I think the interest of humans and animals is fundamental and goes back to the very beginning of time. So at least 40,000 years ago, near Tubigan in the hills just beside me here, uh, humans were carving animals like this out of mammoth tusk. And they did it in three dimensions. This is not 2D, this is 3D. And they did this because even then they knew how essential animals were to their survival, to their livelihood, to their environment. Uh, and nothing has changed since today. 25,000 years later, these cave paintings, just a flash in the pan really in terms of time, uh, again, was all about animals. Animals are central to our lives. And the very birth of photography was all about animals. It was driven in many ways by a desire to understand animals, their motion and their behavior. And the very first applications of photography were to the capture of animals. For example, the work of Mybridge at Stanford, and later in Pennsylvania, and Marais in France. Uh, uh, they were ingenious in trying to understand animal behavior. The, the image, the photograph, and what became the movie or the film um, was really uh, an instrument for understanding animals and their behavior. When we look at computer vision, as a field, I think this to me is the first instance that I, I know of in the field of beginning to formalize what it means to represent or reason about animals in computer vision. Um, Mara Nishihara laid out already in 1978, the principles of um, how we might represent animals, humans among them, in terms of some very basic primitives. Again, they were thinking three dimensions and they were, um, thinking in terms of abstractions that could be simplified and implemented by a machine. Now, despite this early work by Mar Nishihara, not a lot happened after that. I, I went back and I searched through the old computer vision books. You can't find a picture of an animal. There were no pictures of, and it was hard to get pictures in the old days at all, but there were no pictures of animals. There were pictures of houses, lungs, um, people. Um, the first real, uh, focus that I can remember or could think of on, on animals was the Weitzman horse data set. It was just horses. It was originally black and white men color, and it came out in 2002. So there was a long gap really where there didn't seem to be a whole lot going on. Now, some, if some of you remember other things, please send them to me afterwards. I would like to have a little history of this. It's more complete. Um, but at least to me, this was the beginning of also collecting a data set. And a data set, it was actually one of the earlier data sets and it was about animals. Um, and then things began to take off with this idea of labeling and data sets in the field with the MSRC data set being um, one of the early driving ones. And there were things in there like cows among other things, but this began this effort to sort of label uh, the world and animals were interesting and they were thrown in there. Animals were just as interesting as a house or a plane, which was good, it was a step up from the early days. And ImageNet continued that and people were recognizing animals and mushrooms, but animals were somehow not particularly special. That was 2009. And then I really think it was this interest um, coming out of Caltech and UCSD on fine grain classification that really sort of drove people people to start thinking about that maybe animals were a special class of, of, of uh, entities in the world that deserve special study, that one could be an expert in them and that there were features of them that were important. And, and so I really think that this is not that old, but it, it started driving us in an interesting direction. And uh, 
work. I saw Chuck Stewart was on the call. The work out of RPI um, showed that you could identify um, zebras, individuals by the patterns on them. So computer vision was, was now starting to be applied in the field. That was a real change in 2011, 2013. You, you could now take computer vision out of the lab and into the field and begin to do things um, that might be relevant to understanding animals and their behavior. 2013 also was a, um, an exciting year for animals in that the Cashman and Fitzgibbon dolphin paper came out, which really um, laid a foundation for the 3D analysis of animals in images. Um, and I think that that has been followed up a lot. We'll also hear, we'll hear from Andrew, fortunately, and also Sylvia and Sophie, on the, who's the creator of the small model. There's been a growing interest in, in the 3D shape and, and behavior of animals. The next big foundational thing, and we're fortunate also to have Mackenzie Mathis here, um, was the, the, revo the deep learning revolution didn't leave out animals, of course, and deep lab cut uh, really opened up the scientific ex avenues for scientific exploration of animals and animal behavior. Uh, also deep post cut a year later, uh, particularly uh, the group from the MPI and, and Constance looking at, at uh, collective behavior of large swarms of, of animals. Um, all these new tools have really fundamentally changed things. So. When I look at this workshop and I look at past CVPRs, I always feel at the CVPR like, you know, there's a handful of animal papers maybe at, at, at best. And here at this, there's 51 posters and they're, they have a huge variety of ideas, species that are being looked at, problems and, and unique solutions. I think there's a growing interest in animals and a real realization that they do present a unique challenge for our field in terms of data acquisition, labeling, modeling, that things are slightly different with animals than with cars, for example. Um, and that might open up interesting questions. We also know that there are growing pressures on animals due to climate change and human activity, and that our lives literally depend on preserving our animal diversity as people in the in the caves near Tubingen New 40,000 years ago. Um, there are deep scientific questions to be answered. The tools of computer vision uh, could help crack open uh, these questions. And I think there's even money to be made, whether it's in race horses or uh, something else, I don't know. Uh, but there are definitely grants to be awarded and careers to be built. And you know, computer vision has become a very crowded um, crowd that is no animal pun intended, the crowded field of, uh, and it's going, this area of animals in computer vision will also get crowded. It's a really nice size right now. Um, when you've got 50 papers or so, you could get a bunch of people together. You can have a really good conversation. It reminds me of early days of computer vision. So please enjoy it uh, while it lasts. Good times. So uh, with that brief introduction, um, uh, just give you a quick look. This is in Pacific time. Um, we've got this short opening, which is over uh, session one, session two, poster session, which you, I don't know if anyone wants to give instructions yet about gathering. We do that, I guess, right before the poster session. Um, then two more uh, sessions and another poster session. So that. And then of course, these spectacular keynote speakers were really fortunate. Um, I'm not gonna introduce them here because they'll get introduced uh, formally, but uh, it's a really great program in store for us today. So uh, I'm personally really looking forward to it. Is there anything else that um, the organizers wanna add that I have forgotten? No, I think this is perfect. All right, how are we doing on time? Nine, nine oh nine. So, Good. Yeah. We're right uh, on time then. So thank you, Michael, for sharing the big uh, picture and the insight on the, this new emerging field. And as mentioned, I, I really hope that this uh, the workshop can facilitate the collaborator effort to make the computer vision to make some scientific uh, contribution to the field. 
So uh, again, we have about 50 plus submissions and we uh, invite more than 30 reviewers uh, um, from the computer vision, biology and neuroscience. And I would like to thank all these reviewers for who make a, a tremendous effort on that. And uh, so uh, we have uh, five uh, invited speakers and, and uh, and for oral presentation. And we have two poster session in between. So I will hand this over to Natalia who will chair the first session. Uh, thank you, Hyun Soo. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the awesome introduction. So now we can start our first oral session for the day. And our first invited speaker today is Dr. Mackenzie Mattis. Uh, we're really happy to have her. Uh, Mackenzie is the Bertarelli Foundation Chair of Integrative Neuroscience at the PFL. Uh, she's a lead developer of Deep Blood Cut, uh, that's a well-known software package for animal pose estimation. Uh, and her lab works in understanding adaptive mechanisms in intelligent systems. And Mackenzie originally received her PhD at Harvard in 2017. Uh, while we're listening to the talk, uh, uh, everyone in the audience is encouraged to submit your questions over chat. We can take those after the first presentation or uh, after the second oral talk in the joint Q&A. With that, uh, Mackenzie, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Natalia. Can everyone see my screen okay, just in case? Perfect. Thank yes, you. Can see. Uh, excellent. And uh, yeah, thank you, first of all, to the organizers for having me. It's it's quite an honor to speak in this community. It's it's a, kind of a merger of things that I'm super excited and to get to interact with this group here today. And I think Michael just had this gorgeous introduction of the history, which I'm quite relieved that I <laughs> didn't have enough time to go through all of it, but I'll give a little nod to Mar at the end as well. Beautiful work. All right. So my laboratory really works on one of the greatest challenges of neuroscience, which is how the brain drives adaptive behavior. And as part of this quest, we really try to combine neuroscience, engineering, and machine vision in order to answer these type of questions. Our kind of collective mission is really to understand foundational principles in neural computations in order to build next-gen adaptive AI systems. And so what I'd like to do today is tell you about our efforts uh, related to machine vision in our laboratory. So as you probably know, adaptive behavior can really span a huge uh, state space, right? So anything from more classical trial-based uh, behaviors, which is still quite interesting, to certainly uh, taking these things into the wild and back, you know, bringing the wild into the laboratory, which has its own rich and interesting history, and of course, complex motor actions, which we study in our laboratory. So just to give you a few examples, um, part of the work in our lab is not just on um, machine vision, but actually doing experimentations with animals to see how they adapt to the world. So here's a mouse that we teach to play uh, joystick video games, uh, even simple questions about timing and uncertainty, or more ethological tasks for mice, uh, which in the one case where they're actually predators, though they'll hunt crickets. This is collaboration with Chris Neal's group who developed this beautiful paradigm. And then just, of course, trying to understand the animal in its own ecological niche. Uh, since these are laboratory mice, just actually studying them in their natural habitat, I think is quite fascinating for aspects of neuroscience and medicine as well. And so I just want to highlight a few things that uh, when we started getting into this field a few years ago, there are particular challenges that we sort of saw that were unique to maybe animal pose estimation compared to the elegant and beautiful work in human pose estimation. And so, for example, this it sounds kind of obvious, but humans have really different bodies, right? We couldn't leverage a skeleton or a pose, pose prior across all species. Um, so while these are all mice, visually they look quite different in this scenario, but even say a natural mouse feeding or other types of animals that have been used now in computer vision, like studying the hydraulic legs of spiders, um, or the fly example that Michael also nicely showed, or things like comparative biomechanics across different types of um, lizards and geckos and so forth. Uh, another kind of challenge, if you will, is that it's not really practical to label really large scale data sets. And so when we started this, this um, <laughs> it was kind of unknown, like how little data could you get away with in order to make tailored neural networks for these types of applications. 
The other thing is, which I won't really touch much on today, but it needs to be quite fast. So in order to study the brain, we often want to do closed loop perturbations, where based on a behavioral event, you want to say, uh, do an optogenetic space perturbation in the neural circuitry. And so we need these tools to be very fast and uh, even super real time with low latency. We also saw challenges for doing multi-animal tracking um, because they look really identical oftentimes. Like if you take two black mice in their home cage, they can look highly identical, even to a human observer, they're very hard to distinguish. And lastly, which I'll touch more on today is that we're really interested in this vision of making robust like plug and play solutions, right? So many of you are computer scientists in this room, but not all biologists or ethologists or ecologists have a rich uh, computer science background. And so to make these tools broadly accessible is actually takes quite a bit of work, but we can also try to engineer better solutions in order to give these tools back to the community and really democratize AI in that way. I sort of think of it as a, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, many of you in this room, and get kind of paying it forward to the rest of the life science community. So I'll talk a bit more about that today as well. Okay, and so I know this is a bit of a diverse audience, so this is probably very uh, familiar to most of you, but just in case. There's an incredible rich history in human markerless pose estimation, starting back from deep pose and incredible algorithms like deeper cut and open pose and convolutional pose machines, all the way up to now kind of benchmark topping things like higher HR net. And so in general, uh, many of these algorithms work in a similar way, which is that you have supervised ground truth data, you have a predictor, which in this case is a neural network, and you get out of pose. There's a lot of free parameters. So kind of back of the envelope calculations can tell you that you need a lot of labeled data potentially. And we know that deep learning is really accelerating in the performance domain when you have this large amount of data. And so for us, when we started um, back in 2017, we sort of saw these as data hungry algorithms. And I think we all probably agree that they still are, but we wanted to know how we could bring this to the laboratory. And so the short answer is essentially to leverage transfer learning, which you're probably familiar with, which is namely taking a training network and asking it to learn a new task. So I think uh, most famously, ImageNet has had an incredible influence on the field for a multitude of reasons, but also pre-trained on ImageNet has become uh, quite a popular and almost standard technique now in many computer vision applications. And so just to walk you through this, this is a large data set of over 1.2 million images with many classes, many animals and fruits and all kinds of things. Uh, and the, you know, typically what you do is you take a network for say classification, you show it a picture of this uh, cat and it should give you the label cat, right? And so what we did is building and inspired on uh, deeper cut actually, and they were sort of uh, leveraging on some really nice algorithmic developments in deep lab um, was to essentially take a pre-trained network and leverage this to get away with very little data. So now what you can do um, is essentially label the key points of interest. So in our case, right, I kind of showed you this, we're interested in mouse reaching. So here's 13 key points on the hand. You fine tune this network end to end and have new deconvolutional heads and you can get away with very little data. So this was trained on roughly, you know, 140 images, the mice that it now can work on or not in the initial data set. So it generalizes as well. So this was our first paper um, in this path. And um, I highlight a few down here that we've worked on in the subsequent years as well. So the package has really changed dramatically over the years. We try to stay up with state of the art. We have a lot more networks, uh, mini ImageNet pre-trained backbones, and a plethora of other tools, and some of them I'll, I'll highlight today for you. And so just to um, define what I mean by efficient to some degree is in this first paper, what we actually showed was that we first built a data set, a benchmark um, of mice. And here, just to give you a sense of scale, the nose is about 10 pixels wide. And we showed that you know very little data, um, now not into the thousands, but into the tens, around like 50 images, give you a biologically meaningful performance level, right? So if, if the objective here is to label the nose of the mouse, um, the nose is 10 pixels. So even tens of frames actually give you a really uh, reasonable performance. And a few hundred frames, now you're matching, you know, matching human level accuracy for the best labeler that we could find. Uh, as I mentioned, it also generalizes, of course, to unseen animals, which, uh, you know, black six mice to the aficionados, they can be quite different. They're different sizes, different ages, uh, different sexes, uh, but also these networks are not, um, you know, they're able to also say, like, if you put three mice in a similar setting, you'll also be able to detect the poses of, of multiple animals in this scenario. 
I think importantly for the life scientists too, so I just point this out that, you know, the ability to know if a network has done a good job or leverage something about the confidence of the network is really useful, particularly in the cases of highly articulated objects and occlusions, because this was something that was quite challenging uh, with many of the conventional or other approaches um, at the time to do. And so this allows you, of course, then to label, say, a fly that's moving around in 3D space and get both in the left and the right side um, covered, but not plotting data that's uh, off the animal, of course, when they when it's not seen. Um, and just as a kind of a highlight here to say that it doesn't work, just work on animals, there's been a lot of really interesting applications. So for example, tracking cancer cells and how they lice um, in medical applications. So in the larynx or measuring tendons in humans during performance. Uh, down to, of course, multi-animal, which I'll talk about more. So we've been really fortunate to have a huge uptake in the field. We just hit 230 downloads this week, which um, I'm quite excited about. And also just maintaining and engaging with this community has been a big part of this software project. And we've been lucky enough to be also featured and have our users featured in some popular media outlets, uh, you know, helping to spread this tool to many different fields from ecology to life sciences. Um, and just to kind of recap on that, I think, you know, a, a large part of Deep Lab Cut's success, maybe aside from the scientific contribution about transfer learning, was really um, the usability of this tool and making it an entire software package. So going from, say, training these networks or developing data sets, applying different data augmentation types, different network selections, and then being able to run new inference and do this kind of all through a graphical user interface, uh, was one of the things that we really wanted to make sure that our users could do. So that's really allowed a couple different ways to the software to develop. One is sort of a plug-in to a lot of say neuroscience specific things or like real-time pose estimation platforms. But also then there's been a huge community around this that has built tools like taking the output of pose estimation. And so of course, I'm primarily talking about deep lab cut, but as Michael rightly noted, the field is growing and it's really exciting. There's so many really nice tools coming out now and, um, across you know, many different groups, including those from like Ian Cousin and others. And so it's been very fun collectively as a community to see what people are doing with the outputs of such uh, pose estimation packages. So just to give you a few and, and a nod to Weybridge, who as Michael noted, actually had a scientific question about whether the horse lifted all four legs off the ground. Uh, now, hopefully he would be impressed that he no longer had to build a zoopraxiscope to, to study this type of behavior, but could use computer vision to do this. All right, so in the next few slides, I just want to give you some case studies. So this was some work uh, in collaboration with Amir Patel's group at University of Cape Town, South Africa. So he's a biomechanicist and roboticist who's interested in uh, optimal kind of tail locomotion in these cheetahs. So this is work that was just published at ICRA last month. But in general, for this community, I just want to highlight it. They're also at the, at the, at the poster session tonight. Um, but it's a large scale data set of over 7,000 frames and particularly more than 20,000 3D frames of cheetahs essentially in the wild. So I encourage you to check that out and talk to them for more information. Uh, recently, we've also been working on this problem of multi-animal pose estimation, looking at really identical looking animals. So what we did is develop four benchmark data sets that I'm showing you here. So from swimming fish, from multiple mice to marmosets, uh, to parenting mice where the pups look really identical. And through the course of um, building kind of optimizations around this multi-animal problem, we've also been building new network architectures. And so we've tested these against say state-of-the-art models on COCO or other multi-human pose estimation benchmarks and do show that we have state-of-the-art performance um, on these data sets compared to those data. So we used um, some of the in pose implementations and others and, um, and this data and this network is now available as well through Deep Lab Cut. And so Jesse and the other authors will be here tonight if you wanna get more information. But I do wanna just kind of highlight one kind of interesting thing to think about in, uh, you know, humans are animals of course, but you know, animal pose estimation compared to humans. Um, one thing is this body agnosticism. Right, so it's not necessarily obvious when you take a network and you're say doing both learning the body parts with like key points, but also then you know building the limbs like part of affinity fields much inspired by open pose, you know what limb should actually be connected. And so to do that we built kind of an adaptive uh, graph based algorithm that can say take what we might consider a baseline or naive skeleton. Uh, but then also trying to find a data driven skeleton for this right, so I think this is. Um, 
probably one of the reasons, or you know, we sort of know this is one of the reasons uh, that these networks are actually doing a better job because we've optimized them to do better graph assembly for this. So here, what I'm showing you are just some of the output metrics of this, namely um, how many unconnected body parts are left and the purity of the assembly at this stage of the thing. Um, so baseline here is, as I mentioned, sort of naive skeleton, and then this data-driven graph pruning algorithm that we developed. And then another algorithm that essentially is a calibration. So it takes in a prior cost of like a pose prior of these learned uh, edge associations. So the discriminability of the different edges along the skeleton. And so in the next, um, I do on time. Yeah, so in the next part of my talk, what I wanted to kind of give you a vision is about kind of the robustness and where we're going with these types of tools. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, deep lab cut and related animal pose estimation software packages have really risen to the challenge of like, you know, kind of solving this for the one lab experiment or even within a lab, right? You take mice, you can build these networks, they're reasonably robust on your setting. Um, but how will this look if we really want to share like these networks or data sets across labs or even across say an entire animal group like quadrupeds? Or maybe across all mammals, like, is there a way that we could leverage like all this data that people are amassing to do this in a more interesting way? And so, you know, just, you know, simply, you know, the larger the scale of this, the greater the diversity. So we're trying to think about interesting ways in order to like leverage this data uh, smartly. Okay, so our question really is, is how can we create more generalizable, if you will, robust pose estimation networks for the users? And so to do this, uh, as, as many people do in computer vision, we started with a benchmark. Um, so it's not the Wiseman horse data set, but we developed a new data set, which we call horse 10. So this is around 8,000 images of thoroughbred uh, racehorses that sails across the United States. And they were labeled by an expert uh, equinist who really knew the key points in the anatomy of horses um, super well. And so the general idea is that you know, all the horses are actually walking left to right. They're all roughly the same age at these uh, sales, but of course they have very different coat colors. There's different image statistics with the backgrounds. They have different handlers, so and so forth. And so the challenge was is if we train on a small subset of these individuals, how well could these networks actually generalize to horses that we consider like out of domain individuals? Um, and oh yeah, this is my reminder to tell you that all this data is linked on um, papers with code. So if you're interested in playing with this benchmark or the data sets, it's all of course available there. So the first thing we wanted to ask in this work, uh, which was published this year at WACV, was how good are these different uh, backbone architectures? Is there anything inherently better about better image net performing architectures for pose estimation? So Kaiman Hay and others have also looked at this now in the context of um, object recognition and other challenges. Um, but what we found is largely in, yeah, the same vein as what they found, which is that, you know, for pose estimation, these networks that are better on ImageNet are actually performing better for pose estimation. So I didn't put the network names here, but we tested a lot of different mobile nets, res nets, and the state-of-the-art efficient nets as well. And so what you're seeing here is the, um, the blue is, of course, the train. The test is within domain. So on these 10 horses, it's just held out images from these animals. And then the kind of interesting test is this out of domain, right? So these unseen horses that we actually see. And so you do see that these more powerful architectures generalize better, which was maybe a bit surprising given that they have many more free parameters and could be prone to overfitting. And this is a pre-trained on ImageNet backbones, which will become important in a moment. And so in general, um, what we found is that pre-training really matters. That's kind of the take home. I'm not showing you the data here, but you can train for less time, up to six times uh, less with half the amount of data and get the same amount of performance. But importantly, compared to training from scratch, where you see this huge gap between uh, the transfer learning based networks, so pre-trained on ImageNet or training from scratch, especially for these higher performing networks, there's this huge gap to fill. So even just using these pre-trained networks for animal pose estimation is already giving you quite a boost in performance in this robustness domain. To kind of contrast this to the domain shift that might be inherent in the horse 10 task, right? This out of domain uh, individual, we built an, in a horse C, right? So from Dan Hendricks and colleagues, uh, you're probably familiar with ImageNet C. And so we took these same corruptions and essentially corrupted these horses to see how well that they would be, um, or how well these networks would perform in this kind of challenging set. 
And so I'm not showing all the data here, of course, but we tested different uh, domain adaptation techniques in order to try to close this gap. But again, just as a take home, these uh, transfer learnings so the starred lines here are always better than the um, from scratch training on these networks. So again, showing that there's a kind of a benefit for this pre-training and also for batch norm and test time adaptation techniques worked as well. Okay, but what if we like think broader here? This is horses, but what about like across species? So there's a nice paper um, at ICCB a few years ago, which introduced this animal pose data set. And so we took this data set and what we did was say train on all the sheep data in the, in the data set, but then test on the held out species. And here again, by class, like mobile nets, res nets, uh, efficient nets, uh, you saw the same trend that we saw before on the horses. Namely, that uh, better image net performing architectures perform better on this out of domain robustness challenge. But kind of going forward, we, we want to think kind of broader, right? So, um, what if we could build data sets that were better than image net for pre training, that kind of had like more of a pose? you know, prior, if you will, like, uh, and animals certainly are more represented in the data sets. So we started collecting uh, data sets from others and ourselves from like Macaque Pose, which is also here tonight, which is very cool, Stanford Dogs, the Animal Pose data set, uh, Baja. So I think many of the people in this room are represented in this data set that we collected. And so in total, we had around, you know, 50,000 images now that had maybe slightly different key points. So there was some kind of fun things that we had to do to to solve like how to train the same backbone and not penalize like missing key points or key points that weren't um, expressed in other data sets. So we built a gradient masking techniques. We tried to map them across these data sets. And um, you know, the short answer is, is that uh, this is, does improve pre-training compared to ImageNet pre-training. So these are the source domains if you're interested. And again, we have a poster tonight, so you can talk to Shauke, the first author of this work about this in more detail. And then we had some held out data sets for testing in this way. So we built a new data set, which we call iRodents, based on iNaturalist. So we scrubbed iNaturalist and labeled a ton of different rodents um, from this, and then had more kind of lab related uh, work as well. And so qualitatively, what we found uh, very early on or you know, in, this, in this test is that uh, you can get away with smaller amounts of target fine-tuned dating. So even with 16 images of your new domain using this kind of super animal pre-training model base um, is better than ImageNet. And this, of course, is quantifiable. And so I'm not going through all the details here, but we also kind of mixed and matched and combined different data sets to see which ones could confer a positive transfer versus ones which might actually hurt performance. And so you can actually kind of come up with a formula of which data sets are better to combine for your target domain. But in general, we found overall that um, most always the super animal kind of model outperformed image net pre-training and importantly it even gave an uh you know this out of domain robustness test on horse 10 gave it about 11 percent map improvement uh, in this challenge as well um this is just kind of ongoing work but i also want to highlight that of course um you know we're also looking at other things besides Domain adaptation techniques, we're also interested in self and semi-supervised learning. And so we found that these super animal models were also very good at uh, supervised learners. So this gave about a 2x improvement, especially in this low target regime data um, of using pseudo labeling to, to enhance performance. So just coming kind of towards this like larger vision of sharing networks and sharing data, we last year launched what we call the Deep Lab Cut Model Zoo, kind of a tongue in cheek name, given that we work on so many animals. But the idea here is that uh, without any installation of the software, people can just use Google Colab. They simply can click like cat or dog. Um, there's some amazing user contributed things like primate faces or the model from macaque pose, uh, humans, of course. You can just go and upload a video and run uh, inference for these different animals on your data set. Uh, and of course, the cheetahs, in case you have any really big cats at home. And so what we're really trying to do now in this way is to you know, actually just ask you as a call of action for many of the life scientists or those that are interested in computer vision is to help us make better models by making these better data sets. So we've launched this web app. If you're interested, um, you have some free time and want to you know, click on uh, really adorable animals from across these cool data sets, uh, go to contrib at deeplabcut.org. And this is all going back into this community driven effort of building better models for these plug and play type solutions. 
All right, so I think um, I'm good on time. So I'm gonna make sure I wasn't over today. So the kind of the take homes here, and again, here's the, the nod to Mar of this a really amazing legacy, which we also cover in a recent piece in Current Opinion um, about you know, how incredible that we're standing the shoulders of giants. But I hope in this uh, short talk, I've convinced you that uh, you know, deep learning has really revolutionized our ability to anal analyze animal behavior with higher precision and at scale that was never before possible in life sciences. Um, we think that they have particularly interesting challenges in animal pose estimation and even maybe novel solutions. So I think there's a real opportunity here to bridge across the domains in other interesting ways. Um, I showed you that we built an adaptive data uh, driven assembly, which boosts performance compared to say um, higher HR net, which is current state of the art on COCO. Our pre-trained image net networks offer known advantages, namely like these shorter training times and less data requirements. But importantly, they have a novel advantage, which is this robustness to out of domain data, which we think a lot of the life scientists sort of find themselves in this regime. Of course, there's still a gap to close, right? I didn't solve everything <laughs> in the last few years. And so uh, we're very much interested in kind of new techniques that are being driven across, uh, whether that's transformers or batch norm, um, self-supervised learning and better pre-training. And so I kind of hinted at a few of these things that we can start to close this gap with. Um, and importantly, I think, you know, thinking about this, it's also kind of an exciting time to think about like which data sets are converting positive versus negative transfer and how we can better leverage all this amazing community data that is coming in. Um, with that, I want to thank, of course, my amazing collaborators and my group at EPFL and my former lab at Harvard, the people that really were involved in the work today, Jesse Lauer, Xiao Kei Yi, Tian Q, Stefan Schneider, Maxine Vidal, uh, Mu Zhu, and my longstanding collaborator, Alex Mathis, who really uh, spearheaded all of this work with me today. And just as a shameless nod, I want to point out that there's another poster um, tonight from our kind of collective supergroup where they're using transformers for animal pose estimation to do truly end-to-end -end bottom up multi-agent estimation too. So check out this cool work from Lucas uh, tonight. And with that, I'd be really happy to take any of your questions. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, for a very, very interesting talk. So if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question, you can either submit them to the chat or just raise your hand and unmute and ask them live. Uh, in the meantime, I have maybe one question myself, sorry for, for pushing maybe too much, but we, yeah. we know that there are um, several millions of species uh, on earth, right? Do you think there's any hope of solving the problem of animal understanding holistically and have like multi-class predictors that would be just giving us cause estimation for, I don't know, this majority of those? Like how yeah, do you see yeah. after that again? <laughs> No, it's a, it's a great question, right? Like, uh, you certainly, there's really cool work of taking, you know, the same backbone and then having different output heads for different animals. And so, like, knowing when to mix them, I think there's some cool uh, space there for, say, like, the taxonomy style work of uh, Amir Zamir and others to try to think about, you know, combining data sets in smart ways. So, you know, I hope, yes, uh, that eventually we can we could have something like that. I don't think we personally are quite there yet, um, but I think it's a fascinating question. And I really liked, um, you know, your, your question also nods to Michael's point of like animal diversity and conservation are really important efforts that uh, we should be giving back to as researchers working in this field too, so. Awesome, thanks so much. Okay, we have lots of questions. Uh, so maybe let's just go. Um, in the order as I see people in the chat. So David, uh, Scott Hayden, if you could unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, McKinsey, uh, great talk and uh, great work on, on uh, Deep Lab Cut, of course. Uh, I've worked with it quite extensively and worked on trackers that, um, that are solve relating, uh, solving related tasks. But one question I want to ask for you is, especially in the multi-animal case, what do you see as sort of the track refine the future for track refinement like when you have animals that are getting identity switched or we're trying to look at you know multiple animal solutions um instead of manually looking at those tracks and correcting them how do you see uh the future of deep lab cut and the field more generally on refining those in a more automatic way yeah it's a great point so one of the things i didn't touch on here is that um, another output head that we added on into Deep Lab Cut is actually an identity head. So trying to leverage anything that we can possibly see between the differences in animals. Uh, so in the preprint, there's a little bit of a preview of that where 
with the marmosets, uh, we do have a bit of the ground truth identity. Right. And so combining both like temporal information and identity information has been powerful. But I think you're you're absolutely right. Like we need, um, a, it's still a hard problem, especially, you know, animals can just like be all over each other. <laughs> and they're kind of overlapping in ways that a human pose uh, data sets I haven't quite seen. So I think there's a, still a lot of, un, you know, unanswered questions here, but leveraging like unlabeled data, more temporal information, identity, visual information, and potentially in really tricky cases, we can also leverage uh, multimodal data, right? So oftentimes like experimentalists in particular might mark their animals just so they know where to put them back at the end of the experiments or like RFID chips. So doing like multimodal data integration, I think will be a really cool avenue in the future. But yeah, it's a great question, David, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Anguju, do you wanna go next to your question? Yeah, thanks. Hi, Makin. Thank you so much for a nice talk. Um, I'm really curious in terms of 2D pose. Um, I've been looking at these things for a while and not all key points are made equal. I think in particular, the left and the right leg is always really difficult to disambiguate. And this is something I think without having 3D or physical kind of in reasoning, it's very difficult to resolve. I'm curious about your thoughts on like, are these approaches actually starting to differentiate between the left and the right reliably? And is that actually very important uh, for the downstream tasks? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I'll start with the, your last question first, which is yes, often it's really highly important. So they can, you know, just in our own work, we're interested in like biomechanics of the limbs and, the, and they can't be, um, they can't be switching. So there's a couple ways. Um, I think actually it works remarkably well given if the data labeling the input data is good then often the legs like even in the horses you don't see like swapping of the legs in this data set um, or very often or very <laughs> infrequently sorry you see swapping of the legs um, but using of course like temporal information is always going to help in these scenarios too and there's also some smart um, filtering ways to like build in like Kalman prediction models or pose priors so actually in the cheetah work we worked on a kind of a new way to do um, full trajectory optimization with this is with Amir Patel's um, group. Um, and so that's all 3D with the cheetahs, right? Like they're super articulated, they're really fast. There's some great irony of being able to use the fastest land mammal with, with non markerless tracking approaches. Uh, and so all of these tricks and tools are really great. And of course, the human pose estimation field has made amazing strides in things like smaller and, and 3D models. And so this is also trickling into animal pose. And I think the developers of those tools are also here uh, tonight. So I think it's an exciting time for, for doing all of it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Michael. Do you want to go next? Yeah, super inspiring talk. Uh, thinking about how things are progressing in the human, uh, in the sort of non-animal world, uh, or the human animal world, uh, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a lot of effort on action recognition. So you have yes. video data sets and mocap data sets where they're labeled at a higher level than this about behavior. When you go to this, I mean, are you moving in that direction? And, and if you go to the super animal data set, are the behaviors going to be comparable in any way? Will you get the same payoff of putting them all together if their behaviors are all really different? Yeah, it's a fantastic question, right? So the field of like action recognition or action segmentation on each frame is really also growing a ton in, in the animal world. Um, so we do a bit of this, it's mostly directed towards scientific questions. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that we're working on in the laboratory is that we're interested in just the general life of these mice and how they interact with objects in the world. So that drives in a lot of like action recognition, 3D computer vision for objects, like these types of things. Uh, so we're working a bit in that direction. Also, Alex Mathis is really focused on uh, these things and, and others are too. So I do see a lot of crosstalk. And I think as people are getting more literate about the really amazing tools that are being developed in computer vision, um, it's trickling more to life sciences. So I really see this like really amazing time frame now where these are coming together. And even, uh, you know, using Vibe, I've seen like people using Vibe in uh, human neuroscience experiments and things like this. So I think it's uh, it's trickling fast, which I think is fantastic. So that's great. 
Thanks. And we have one more uh, live question before, before we move to the next talk. Uh, Abbasin, do you want to go? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was really uh, inspiring. So uh, I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. The first one is um, uh, when you perform the fine twins, uh, do you use the same fine twins technique uh, on like on different animals? Uh, like uh, you use the same um, uh, Fine-tuned strategy for, um, uh, for example, uh, the cheetah, or and the same one on the on the lion, or do you have to use uh, different strategies? And how much uh, actually effort uh, do you put in fine-tuning uh, those models? And the second one is uh, basically I found that uh, your tool is mostly developed uh, with TensorFlow, so I'm wondering if you are planning an extension on uh, on, for example, PyTorch. Uh, in the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great question. So I'll start with the second one. Um, absolutely, yes. So we have uh, active discussions and work in PyTorch uh, going on as well, because you're absolutely right. All of it is in TensorFlow right now, um, but we would like to expand, you know, the model zoo, even in the, the canonical word of, of model zoo. So yes, um, your first question, though, is, is fantastic. And so we have um, in, the, in the versions that um, are public right now, the idea is that it's really a user defined network in this and like the output heads right so the key points are they can absolutely choose and so the heads are always uh essentially fresh for each person like whenever you make a network that's is established based on what you input it um but we do fine tune all the weights end to end um we haven't yeah i'll leave it at that but for the for the super animal we actually are interested in kind of the the head and the neck, if you will, and the backbone, and which features should be saved. So if you are at the poster session, uh, Shaoki Yi has worked and thought a lot about like when to retain the head, when to make a de novo head, like these types of questions. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't have a solid answer for every animal case out there, but I think it's a really good direction to work in. So thanks for the great question. Yeah. Thank you too. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so to stay in time, we now we need to move to the second talk, which is going to be oral presentation uh, of the workshop paper, but we can take more questions for Mackenzie and the speakers after, after that. Okay, so the presentation is called uh, Special Temporal Event Segmentation for Wildlife Extended Videos, and the authors are Rene Munir, uh, Roman Gala, Jorn Turkov, uh, Sudeep Sarkar. Uh, please, the stage is yours. So is this going to be a, a pre-recorded video or? So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? And I'm very excited to be here today to present our work on event segmentation for wildlife extended videos. Thank you organizers for making this event possible. This work is a joint effort between myself and Dr. Sarkar at the University of South Florida and Dr. Gula and Dr. Pierre Kauf at the Museum and Institute of Zoology, Polish Academy of Sciences. The goal is to temporally segment the important event regions from background events and spatially localize the event causing object in each frame. We segment the video by inspecting the prediction error in the high level feature space. Prediction error peaks indicate switching from one event to another, as can be seen in the event of the bird walking into and out of the nest. Our model is heavily inspired by cognitive psychology theories, specifically the theory by Zachs et al. on event segmentation. The event segmentation theory dictates how perceptual inputs are processed sequentially to detect event boundaries as peaks in the prediction error signal. First, perceptual or sensory inputs are processed by a perceptual processing unit to extract high-level features. The features at time step t are transformed to predicted features for time step t plus one by going through a prediction block. The future predicted features are then compared to the actual future features in the error detection block. High prediction error resets and updates the event model. Updating the event model represents transitioning from one event to another. Not being able to predict good features signals the need to switch the outdated event model with a more suitable model that can better extract and predict features. Our architecture builds on top of the event segmentation theory. 
Input frames are processed by CNN Backbone to extract useful features. We use our current neural network to build the event model in its hidden state. The prediction of the future features is conditioned upon the event model depicted by the hidden state. We also use the hidden state to predict an attention heat map, which can be used to localize and track the event causing object, which is in our case, the Kaggle bird. Prediction error is calculated by comparing the predicted future features to the actual future features. The prediction error is weighted by what we call the motion loss calculated as the difference between the current and the future features. We analyze the performance of our model on a wildlife monitoring data set, specifically monitoring the Kaggle bird for 10 days at 25 frames per second. Annotated events include feeding the chick, nest building while sitting on the nest, nest building around the nest, walking into the nest, and walking out of the nest. The data set is collected with the required permissions. Here we show a time-lapse video of the bird sitting in the nest and localized by attention maps. Our system can learn robust representation of the bird in a self-supervised way. Representations are good enough to ignore severe distractions such as shadows and lighting variations. Unlike the bird, shadows are always moving, yet the attention maps have been focused on the bird. We also show how our approach keeps attention on the bird while transitioning from day to night and from night to day. And here we show an example of true positive detection on the left and false positive detection on the right. The false positives detect events that are not labeled in our data set. More examples can be found at the project page with the link in the QR code on the top right corner. To quantify the performance of our approach, we use an ROC curve to plot the trade-off between recall and false positive rate. Frame level event segmentation counts the true positive detections as frames correctly classified as part of an event. Activity level segmentation requires the use of Hungarian matching to achieve one-to-one -one mapping between detected and ground truth events. We can achieve a recall rate of 80% for one false positive event for every 50 true positive events. This concludes our presentation. Feel free to ask questions now and or during the poster session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for Remy, please ask your, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we still have lots of questions from Mackenzie in the chat, so maybe I can ask one of those in the meantime. So I see a couple of people who are interested in knowing about my uh, applications of the post estimation in neurobiology. Uh, can you comment on that if you're still with us? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, actually, so Alex and I wrote a kind of a current opinion in neurobiology paper recently that covers some of the kind of super exciting um, applications. I mean, I'm a bit biased in, um, in probably what I read since I'm interested in sensory motor control, but there's been some really beautiful work. I think at this point, you know, over five nature papers that have used this to look at new neural circuits and brainstem 